Hi, I'm Pastor Bob Stett. I'm the pastor of Abundant Life Ministries of the Valley in San Jacinto. I want to thank you for inviting us into your home for today's message. I do ask you, though, to just quieten your spirit and just open up your heart and listen to the Word of God. I know He's got a word for you. But one thing for sure, he's got this word for every one of us. Jesus is saying in John 10:10, 10, 10, he's speaking of the devil. He says, he comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I, Jesus says, but I come that they may have life and that they may have life more abundantly. So Satan is there to rob you and to steal from you and to destroy things in your life. But Jesus, he wants to give it all to you abundantly, more abundantly, he says. And so, why don't you come on in and let's get into the Word of God and see what the answer is that's just for you. Here we go. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're so glad that you're here and we would like to just invite you to, to come and visit our church. Uh, we have services Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, Sunday night at 6, and Thursday night at 7. Uh, you are welcome to come and uh, visit us and hear the sermons and to be ministered to. So come and join us. If you don't have a home church, then come and try and see if our church would be for you. And so today as we start our message, the title of my sermon is, If You Don't Know Where You're Going, How Will You Know When You Get There? You know, so many things in our life, we run in circles. We go 100 miles an hour and we get nowhere. It's very important for us to understand that God gives us direction every time we need it. Whether it's every 15 minutes, whether it's every hour, whether it's every 24 hours, God is ministering and speaking to us on a regular basis, giving us the way that we should go. But if you don't know where you're going, how will you know when you get there? And so the Word tells us that one of the biggest problems in our society today is that we're indecisive. We don't know whether we're up or whether we're down. People today, we change our minds like we change our socks. Indecisive. And it seems like the faster we go, the more indecisive that we are. And I want to cover that today because there are things in your life that you need to make decisions on. And you know what? You need to make decisions and stick to them. Not just make decision after decision and you're flip-flopping around every time you turn around. But the Word tells us that so many, many people start out in areas of their lives with great enthusiasm. Boy, they're going to, it's like a New Year's resolution. How many of you know you don't keep New Year's resolutions? But God's Word isn't a New Year's resolution. God's Word means that you need to be enthusiastic about what He is talking to you about and the direction that He's telling you to go. But all the time that we are enthusiastic, the enemy is working on us in order to get us to burn out. You know what? One day we are up and we are going and we're going to whip the world and we're going to witness and we're going to invite people to church. We're going to read our Bible. We're going to do all these. And three or four days later, we're laying in the bed depressed. Well, see, that's because the enemy has you in a place that you don't know where you're going. You have to know without a shadow of a doubt that you have a direction to go and that God is walking with you every step of the way. This happens in our personal lives, but sadly, our Christian walk is even more, it's even more abused in this area. And so many of us, we have jobs and we wouldn't think about not getting up and going to work. You know why? Because you get a salary. My husband has always laughed and said, you know what? We need to pay people to come to church. If they came to church, they'd be here every Sunday, every Thursday. But you know what? You do get paid for going to church. The best benefits that you could ever have is by you being faithful to the assembly of God. God pays you 
for a better choice of words. He pays you by teaching you and guiding you and, and giving you direction and uh, letting you know the things in your life that you need, need to do away with, things in your life you need to add to. So God is the best, best source that you will ever have in your life. So treat church and treat serving God in a manner that you have one thing in mind, and that's to hear him say that you are a good servant of his. The word says the saddest reality is people, they flirt with church or the title of being a Christian. Do you know there are people who go in and try church? They try a few services and then they run around for the next 20 years of their life telling people they're a Christian when maybe they've only been to church a handful of times. They don't even do the things that, th that God tells them to do. They have no idea what the Word teaches them. And yet if you ask them, they will tell you that they're a Christian. I would rather have somebody be out on the street living a life full of sin and them know that they are not in church being what they want to be. I'd rather minister to someone like that than I would someone who sits in a church for a few Sundays or a few months or a year or two, and then they literally are not serving God, but they still keep the title of a Christian. Do you know what? Is there enough evidence about you to convict you of being a Christian? I would say many, many people there's not enough evidence to convict them. But what they do, people flirt with church and the title of Christian, and then they burn out after they've had a little experience. Maybe they don't like the pastor. Maybe somebody offended them, said something they didn't like. Uh, maybe they thought the service was too long, too short. The music was too loud. The music was too soft. They sang out of hymnals or they sang from an overhead. Something all the time that a person ends up burning themselves out because they're not in the word feeding their spirit. People running around calling themselves Christians and they are no more a Christian than the man in the moon. And their lives are anything else but the quality of being a Christian. You would be amazed at the number of people that I meet and have to feel my way around seeing where they come from. Do you know I've known people and maybe they've moved on or they've gone to another area or I don't see them for a while. And the minute you run into them, you realize you're going to have to feel your way to see if they're still serving the Lord. How sad. How sad that we have to just walk on eggshells to see if someone is still being faithful, still being obedient, still being trustworthy, and being locked into a home church and being accountable. We come from a society today is that I don't want to be accountable to anybody. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me where to go. Don't tell me what I have to do in the word. Don't tell me that I have to come to church. Don't tell me I have to be a tithe payer. Don't tell me I have to give offering. Don't tell me. I, oh my goodness. Can you imagine if your child, but sadly to say that our children, our little children, just go to the grocery store and see them laying in the aisle, kicking their feet, having a moment because mom wouldn't buy them a candy bar and they're laying on the floor screaming and yelling. Do you know that's what the church looks half the time? They're laying on the floor kicking and screaming because somebody told them that this is what you need to be doing. And we have the attitude of I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I don't have to listen to you. Well, you know you don't, but you need to listen to God's word. God's word will make you strong. God's word will make you happy. God's word will give you discipline. It'll teach you things that nobody else can teach you. God's word will do it. And so as we see uh, people, you, you have to be very careful. Uh, they are uh, living in their own fantasy world, doing what they want to do. Many times people have gotten off into some weird belief. You'd be amazed at the people who run from church to church to church and they pick up a little teaching here and a little teaching there and then they form their own religion. They go, you know what? I don't need to learn anymore. I don't have to do anything anymore. I've got it all down pat and I've heard enough sermons and I've gone to church enough. But you know what? They get into weird things. And before long, because they don't have God's word to keep them on the right path. See, they don't have any idea where they're going. If you don't know, how will you know when you get there? You have to have a stopping place when God says, this is where I intended for you to be. You have to know where you're going. So the word says, you see people who don't know where that is, 
where that place is, where that thought is. People get lost in their thoughts. They get lost in depression, anxiety, frustration. They get lost in a false teaching. You, you hear people, you see people on television, and you know that they started out in the right way, but somewhere they got off the path, and now they're promoting something that is not God's word at all. But they'll swear, they will swear that they know exactly what they're doing. They'll swear that they are teaching or they're ministering or they're, they're passing on exactly what God's word says. You know, it's that old saying about having an old wives' tale. You'd be amazed at the people that I have talked to and ministered to. And do you know what? They quote old wives' tales. It's no more God's word than anything. But if you would stop them and, and say to them, what scripture is that? They would not know what it is because they have learned and passed on old wives' tales. But they'll swear to you that they are perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with what they're teaching or what they're saying. But God has given us a guideline to follow to keep our journey in check. Is your walk with God in check? Are you setting in underneath a sound doctrine, a sound authority? Are you willing to set underneath a sound doctrine, a sound authority? Or does the hair on the back of your neck bristle up when you think somebody is telling you something that you don't want to hear? As long as it's according to Scripture, you need to listen to what God is telling you because every single one of us can get off into our own things if we don't let God check us many, many times. Sometimes I need to be checked in a day. Many times in a day. I can get up in the morning with an attitude. Anybody out there got up in the morning with an attitude? Well, I'll tell you, I can get up many mornings with an attitude. Do you know that when you have an attitude, you're not teachable? You're not trainable. You won't let someone maybe say, look, maybe you better turn a little left here. Something's a little out of whack. You know what we do? Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. I know exactly what I'm doing. See, an attitude. You can't be taught if you've got an attitude. So you'll know when you get there. I want you to keep hearing that ringing in your ear after this, this time of, uh, that we have together is over. I pray that that will ring in your ear. Will I know when I get there? Am I going the right direction? Am I doing what God wants me to do? Turn with me to 1 Kings. We're going to hear something because Elijah needed to know that he was going in the right direction. And in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, the 15th and the 16th verse, the word says that then the Lord told Elijah. Now listen, Elijah could not get up that morning with an attitude because here God is wanting to speak to him. He may have missed exactly where he was supposed to be going if he was not focused on listening to God. And the Lord told him, Elijah, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, now see, he knows where he's going. God has given, given him instruction and he's going to go back to Damascus where he came from. And it says, when you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu to be king of Israel. Now see, he's giving him direction. He is telling him what he wants him to do. He's giving him a destination. And when he gets to that destination, he has given him three things to do when he gets there. The first two we just read. And it says here, and then he said, and anoint Elijah to replace you as my prophet. Now here is Elijah, the older prophet. God is giving him direction and he is telling him, I want you to go to Damascus and when you get there, I want you to anoint someone else to take your place. Now do you know that most people, when they're in the ministry or they're in something in their life, and they have ownership of, you have to be very careful having ownership because see, God was telling Elijah that he was going to go away, that he was going to now have to pass his mantle on to somebody else. Do you know that if we have an attitude, if we're not teachable, trainable, amen, and then God gives us direction to do something, 
if we're not really listening with our spirit, we can stay in something too long. We can be in an area too long. But God spoke to Elijah and he said, I want you to anoint Elijah, the young prophet, and I want you to anoint him to take your place. God knew from Elijah's life. Now listen, this is a lifestyle. Uh, people say, boy, I want God to speak to me. I want God to tell me this. I want God to do this. And he doesn't seem to talk to me and he doesn't seem to give me information. Well, first of all, are you listening? Second of all, can he trust you with what he's telling you? Many, many times God cannot tell us or speak to us because he can't trust us with what he wants us to know. But he watched Elijah walk his life. He knew that God was everything to him and he could trust him with the information. And so God saw that Elijah would do exactly as God instructed him. Elijah had a proven life. Do you have a proven life? Do you know, I see people, they have a proven life already. They have a proven life that you couldn't trust them as far as you could throw them. They have a proven life all right. They've proven that, that they lie and cheat and steal and con, carry their Bibles under their arm and go to church every time the doors are open and you couldn't turn your back on them if you wanted to because you can't trust them. Now see, that's not a Christian. That's a churchgoer. That's somebody who's religious. That's somebody who's in a social setting called church. But I'll tell you, Elijah had proven his life to God. And the word says, think about this instruction, Elijah, go anoint Elijah to take your place. Now turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 13. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were traveling from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elijah, stay here for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elijah replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together to Bethel. Elijah said, no, no, Elijah, I'm never going to leave your side. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to walk where you walk. I am going to be your servant. You can trust me because I will never leave you. Today, that, that is a sentence you probably very seldom, if you hear it, you can't believe it. You know, I'll never leave you. That's what a husband at the altar says to his wife. I'll never leave you. And a year later, he's gone. Or a wife looking at her, a mother looking at her children. I'll always be here to take care of you. And then she abandons them. It's a very scary thing. But that's where our society stands today. To say, I'll never leave you. God has put that in our hearts to be that kind of a person that will be steadfast, sound, trustworthy. And that is exactly what Elijah was. He said, oh no, Elijah, wherever you go, I'm going with you. Whatever you do, I'm doing it with you. I can remember my husband telling me when we used to live back east, and he came to me and he said, I believe we're supposed to go to California. You are gonna go to California with me? And I remember thinking, oh, well, if you're going, I'm going. You're not going anywhere without me. I don't care what you say, what you do. When you turn around, I'm, you're going to run back into me because I'm going with you. And that's the way we need to be about serving God. God, you tell me to do this as long as you go with me. I'm going. It's as simple as that. And so he goes on to say, as surely, as surely as you live, Elijah, I'm going to go with you. And it says, when they got to Bethel, a group of prophets, now this was the school of prophets, this was a young, young prophet school, and we'll go on about that in just a few minutes. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elijah, and they asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And we're going to cover that, how they knew that and why they were asking Elijah that. And Elijah said, be quiet, be quiet. Of course I know that Elijah is going. And then Elijah said to Elijah, You stay here in Bethel, for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. But Elijah said to Elijah again, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. And so they went together to Jericho. 
Then the group of prophets from Jericho came to Elijah and asked him, Did you know that the Lord is going to take away your master today? And Elijah said, Be quiet. Of course I know. And then Elijah said to Elijah, Stay here in Jericho, for the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River. And the word goes on to say, But again, Elijah says, Oh, Eli Elijah, as surely as the Lord lives, and you yourself live, I will never leave you. And so they went on together to the Jordan River. Now let's go back just a little bit and pick up why Bethel? Why Jericho? Why the Jordan River? Because Bethel was where Elijah had founded the school of prophets. He wanted to make sure that these young prophets that were setting under the teaching, setting under the ministering, were coming up behind him and that they were well trained in the wisdom of God. Oh, think about that, people. Our young people, what are they learning? How are they being trained? Elijah said, before I go, God, I want to go check on what you made me over, the master over. I want to check on that. And then Jericho, it was the same thing. Those young men, those young prophets were Elijah's legacy. They were his legacy that he wanted to make sure that they had not gotten off balance, that someone had not come in and had maybe led them astray or got them into a wrong teaching or a false teaching. He wanted to check that before he went. And then Jordan, the river Jordan, to return where he started. That's where Elijah started, to take one last look at where God had taken him from. People, do you take time to remember where God brought you from? Do you go back in your memory? Do you go back in the time when you were, when you were lost? When you, if you'd have lived one more day the way you were going, you would have been lost forever. But God says, I want you, Elijah, to go back where I found you, where I started you from, and remember. But the word says that 50 men from the school of the prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elijah stopped beside the Jordan River. And then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided and the two of them walked across on dry land. When the two came to the other side, Elijah said to Elijah, What can I do for you before I am taken away? See, God had already spoken to Elijah and told him, Today is your day. What I'm going to do with you, you have to trust me that it's me that is talking to you. And Elijah said to Elijah, Please make me your rightful successor. Now that is something that many of us, oh, we want to walk here and do this and have the fanfare and, oh, I want to be a pastor and I want to be a pastor's wife and I want to be, are you willing to walk the walk? Are you willing to take on what it is to be called that title? See, Elijah knew what it was to be called a prophet and he had walked and trained Elijah and then Elijah at the last said, oh, let me be your successor. It says, if you have asked a difficult thing, but if you see me taken from you, then you will get, my, re, get your request. But if not, if you're not right here with me, if you are not standing at the second that I'm taken away, then you will not get your answer. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between them and separating them, and Elijah was carried up in a whirlwind to heaven. Now think about this. Elijah is in heaven alive. Then another prophet was Enoch. Enoch was taken to heaven alive. And there was a necessity in that because in the tribulation period, at that time, those prophets are going to come back and they're going to stand right in Jerusalem and they're going to be witnesses. And then the word says that the false prophet and the Antichrist will put them to death. See, Enoch and Elijah had to go alive. It says, Elijah saw it and cried out, My father, my father, and the chariot and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, 
Elijah then picked up Elijah's cloak and returned to the bank of the river Jordan. He struck the water with the same cloak that Elijah had used. And he said this, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Are you serving today the God of Elijah? Are you sure that's what you're doing? Is your church, is your pastor, is your fellowship, are you sure that you are serving the same God of Elijah? Where is this God, Elijah said? And the river divided as he struck the cloak that Elijah had left him. We see Elijah walking the path that God has set before him. He knows where he is going and he will know when he gets there. Do you know where you're going? Are you sure? Are you indecisive or are you sure? Are you on fire one day and the next day you're cold? Do you, do you have people need to check you out to see if you're really still serving the Lord? Do you know where you're going in your marriage? in your emotions, in your finances, you need to ask God today, God, I want to know where I am going so I will know when I get there. I pray that this has been a message that will ring in your ear and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for joining us once again. I do hope that today's message has been a blessing to you. Remember one thing though, just because you have failed in an area or two of your life doesn't make you a complete failure. And just because you may feel weak in an area or two of your life, it doesn't make you a weakling. You see, God, he says in his word, he has started a good work in you and it is going to be him that's going to finish that work in you. And so, just do this. Stay in the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Abide in the Word of God and walk in the Word of God. Because as you do, your thoughts are going to be transformed. Your thoughts are going to be transformed. I need to say that again. And your speech is going to be different. Your conduct's going to be different. And so just be conscious every day of what's going on in your life. I'd like to add also that today can be the very first day of you making Jesus personal in your life. Not just a religious experience, but a relationship. He should be everything to you. When you rise in the morning, when you lay your head down at night, he should be on your mind. He, you should be living according to the way he would want you to live. So I'm challenging you right now Take a look at what's going on in your life today. Is he the center of everything? Because that's the desire of his heart. So I just ask you to just take the words that have been said and let them lead you and guide you to one thing, and that's a life with Jesus Christ. Thank you. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>